Okay, good. Well, I guess uh, I'm, I'm the last up, but you know, what was really great, I, I know the team does such a fantastic job with organizing everything from the location to the food to the speakers and everything else. It's just thinking about all the connections between uh, what the guys just spoke about and also some of the things that Parag said earlier. You know, diapers.com, that was a company uh, that I invested in. You know, buy online, pick up in store is a concept that I've written some research about. And then average basket size being much higher. Uh, and he's just coming in right now. So I'll, I'll stop talking about, uh, about Parag. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, he's looking around. So it's really great to see all these threads coming through. So what I'm going to talk about today is really based on a personal journey, and it's coming from three different perspectives that I've had on the space of consumer and retail that I've been active in for about the last 20 years. So it's a perspective, first of all, as a, as a professor. So I ended up being a professor of some of the kind of iconic founders um, in the consumer and retail space, which is very lucky to to do that, I had no uh, particular role in sort of making that happen. I was just kind of Johnny on the spot. Uh, and then secondly, as a researcher, someone who's taken data from these new consumer and retail companies and learned about how they kind of operate under the hood. What does it mean to be omni-channel? How do you build basket size? What happens when customers have experiences with brands in real life and so on? And then the third one is really as an investor. First of all, just as a small personal investor and now as somebody who's running a fund entity um, with my team and my co-founder in New York, we have about 27 investments only in the consumer and retail space. I know that's not always a very sexy thing to say in 2022. People think consumer and retail is no good. Well, I got news for you. Well, maybe not you guys. You believe in this. If you look around the world, you know, people have to eat. People need clothes. The families who sort of do well globally are typically family zone, things like supermarkets and apparel and all of that kind of stuff. So that everyday consumption is still really important. Now, um, the title, oops, just clicking here. Sorry, my slide is not... Advancing. I don't think you guys want to just look at me all, uh, all afternoon. Okay. That's all right. Okay. Oh, oh there we go. Okay. So, um, so the thanks so much, guys. So the choice of title is very deliberate. So learnings from consumer and retail, innovation in the small. And I don't mean small in terms of small ideas, but what I mean is attention to detail, attention to detail. And hopefully that will become clear as we go through. And I'm going to bifurcate two different kinds of innovation, but they're basically going to come together as well. Sometimes these divisions are not as clear cut as sort of the left and the right. So insight innovation is what I'm going to anchor to the consumer side of the story. And I'm going to show you guys some iconic consumer brands. I'm sure there are people in the room here who are consuming at least one. Let's see if we can get someone who's consuming all four, or if you know someone who's consuming the fourth. And then on the other side, I'm going to talk about model-based innovation. And model-based innovation is going to be anchored more to the retail. Okay, so that's how the story is going to go. And um, I'm going to sort of start out sort of, you know, thinking and going back. This goes to some of the things that Parag just spoke, of, spoke about, the enabling factors of the internet and how the iconic brands in the space um, have kind of allowed us to do things and taught customers interesting stuff. So on the left here, you've got Amazon, you know, the company's a little over, I guess, 30 years old now. Was, I think it was the first company to get to a trillion dollars. I remember having a debate with one of my students, was it going to be Apple or Amazon? Uh, and so, yeah, I think it was Amazon that won that race. And the insight that Jeff Bezos had was when the technology first came out, how could you sell people stuff that only had digital attributes? So as a former academic, I kind of help two things. I might actually cold call someone like Harishi, uh, you know, this is looking shocked. Um, and I also might throw out a bit of academic jargon, but some of it hopefully is useful. So there's a terminology, the distinction between a digital and a non-digital attribute, and this ties into what Parag said too. So a digital attribute is an attribute for which the way you experience it is the same online as it is offline, okay? So if I were to buy somebody's book, Parag wrote a book, um, seeing that online or offline, there's no confusion to me. I know what the title is, I know what the content is, I know what the price is, but you know, buying the sweater, which uh, I don't know if it was a wise choice or not, uh, you might not know how it's going to fit and so on. And so the early days of consumer and retail was about solving the problem of non-digital attributes. So think about what Tony Shea did, very sadly passed away, but remember he started a great company, Zappos, he sold to who? Amazon. To Amazon for about a billion dollars, right? And Tony's insight was, I may not want to buy shoes online because the shoes may not fit. So hey, Dave, just order five, send back four and keep one for yourself, and I'll take care of the whole thing. And he wrote a whole book about delivering happiness. Okay? So the distinction between digital and non-digital attributes is going to be important. And thanks to technology, more and more products, and Prague talked a lot about grocery, what's more digital than a non-digital than a banana? Okay, there's a company in New Zealand that will sell you avocados online. And you might be concerned, right, David, about the ripeness. But what they do is they sell you seven all in different stages of ripeness. So the first one you can eat immediately, and the last one's going to ripen up in a week. 
So solving the problem of non-digital attributes. The other interesting thing here, I was fortunate to be an early investor in diapers, is the transition from the generalist to the specialist. And this always sort of puzzled me, maybe you guys who have pop theory, people really like to buy Pampers diapers, or they did, on diapers.com more than they did on Amazon. Like, it's the same thing. It's literally the same product, but somehow if you've got kids, you sort of believe that those guys at diapers.com, all they do is they think about stuff that kids want, like diapers and formula and so on, so I'm gonna buy from the specialist. And so those are sort of two really important things about the enabling factors. Okay, so let's get into the consumer innovation. And if I had a whiteboard, I'd write it down, but I'll just articulate it verbally, okay? Um, so the question I want us to anchor to here when we think about insight innovation as it relates to consumers is just a question, what's wrong with the status quo? What's wrong with the status quo? Why can't I get exactly what I want? And I'm gonna say why this is important later on, but I'm gonna illustrate with an example that we all know, um, Starbucks. Okay, so you may know the apocryphal story of Howard Schultz. Uh, by the way, he was rejected by over 200 VCs out of 240 that rejected him, all had the same uh, answer to Mr. Schultz. And the reason they said that you know, they didn't want to invest in this thing is, couldn't any joker like Udai and I go out and buy a coffee machine and open up a Starbucks? Like, there's absolutely no differentiation in that. What they didn't understand was the power of that little logo and the ubiquity of the distribution strategy and the branding and the third place and everything else. But Schultz's insight, what's wrong with the status quo, came from a holidaying in uh, Italy. And he noticed uh, in America, people drink a lot of coffee. In Italy, people drink a lot of coffee. In America, people drink a lot of bad coffee in the home made by you. In Italy, people drink a lot of good coffee out of the home made by a die in the barista, okay? So what's wrong with the status quo? And that was the genesis of that consumer idea. Now, when we think about retail, the question I want you guys to have in mind and the, these things are obviously a little bit permeable, right? Is what function or what activity should be done by whom? What function or what activity should be done by whom? Who should own, for example, the customer experience? And the company here, sort of hard to avoid, of course, is uh, Apple. You know, Apple, last time I checked, I think the value of Apple is about the same as the GDP of India. I mean, isn't that mind-blowing? And I'm old enough to remember when I was a student at university using MS-DOS, there was just a few sort of cool people like Laura, you know, using Apple. They were like the artsy types and the company was almost going bust. But somehow this thing has come back as a behemoth. And one of the greatest things Apple ever did was say, hey, the experience of buying happens in a store. And we're not a commodity. And can someone tell me, um, as, a, as a cold call, uh, who was the other company in California that opened stores that fizzled within six months? There was another computer company that opened up about the same time as Apple, and this is hugely controversial, right? Because what it, not, uh, Microsoft's done them since. Gateway, bingo. So Gateway opened up stores they closed in six months because Gateway was selling you nothing other than the box or the commodity. Apple recognized that they could control an experience. Okay? So what function should be done by whom? That's the retail innovation question. Okay, now I've got to throw a little bit of cultural uh, you know, uh, Appropriate, well not appropriation, I'm actually from New Zealand, so a bit of cultural leverage into our innovation story here. And this is also relevant, I think, really specifically to consumer and retail. So we have Tenzing Norgay and Edmund Hillary, and they did something really miraculous. You know, back in the 50s, they ascended Everest, and they were asked in a press conference, hey, guys, this was mind-blowing what you've done. Um, you know, this was absolutely fantastic. It was extraordinary. And uh, what they said was, their answer was quite interesting. The answer was, well, you don't have to be an extraordinary person to do an extraordinary thing. You just need to be an ordinary person sufficiently motivated. And uh, this is something that I see in my daily life all the time. And, you know, um, it's probably been around too much, but it's fun to watch if you haven't watched it. Think about Michael Dubin, the founder of dollarshaveclub.com. Maybe the acquisition to Unilever didn't go exactly as planned. But that was just a guy who was kind of had a comedic background. He was annoyed at the price of his razors. He got someone to build a website, someone else to warehouse the product, someone else door co and career to manufacture it, and he made a video that started out, hi, I'm Mike. Have you guys seen this? Founder of dollarshaveclub.com. What is dollarshaveclub.com? We bring high quality razors right to your house for a dollar. Yeah, a dollar. You know, I've watched it so many times, I can do the whole thing. And then, he, you know, are the blades any good? And then he walks through that side, no, the blades are, you know, blank, blank, great, okay? Do you like paying, you know, $20 for brand name razors? 19, go to Roger Federer. I'm good at tennis, you know, that whole thing, right? So that guy, from starting in 2012, sold his company in 2016 for a billion dollars. He was just an ordinary guy, but he did something actually quite extraordinary. And that permeates the retail and consumer space. Okay, so let's go into the consumer. And here we're thinking about, again, what's wrong with the status quo. That's what we're going to anchor to. 
And what I want to do is I want to share with you guys sort of four brands that, I mean, just selected by me, but I think these are brands that illustrate four really interesting points about consumer innovation. Uh, and also, they're sort of presented in chronological order. So this one here is sort of 2008, 2009. Does, does anyone know um, where this company started? Or someone tell me what the company sells? Socks. Sells socks, yep. Sells apparel. I mean, hopefully Andy Dunn's not watching. It sounds a bit unkind. But it's kind of like a J. Crew online. It was a men's apparel company. And the first product was uh, a pair of pants, better fitting pants. So what they did is they took sort of knowledge from making pants for ladies, and they lowered the waist, and they put on more elastic. And if you were wearing them, so I would have some sort of checkered thing in the pocket, so you could always see if some guy was wearing bonobos, OK? So we'll get into more of the example later on. But that was 08, 09. Uh, who's heard of Warby Parker? <laughs> OK, almost everybody. Right, so this is a company that started in around 2010 by four Wharton students in the fashion eyewear category. Um, what about this one here? I know we talked about, Prague told us about uh, pets. Medical scrubs. Medical scrubs, right? You cannot go to a vet or a doctor or a dental clinic without typically seeing somebody wearing scrubs, okay? And we'll talk about, oh, and then this last one here, Caraway. Cookware, Cookware okay, so fantastic. So we got them all covered. So uh, maybe a show of hands, I know we're getting late in the day. Who, who's bought at least one of these products? Okay, keep your hand up if you bought at least two. Okay, and keep your hand up if you bought at least three. Okay, okay, what about four? Are there any fake doctors in the room? Okay, <laughs> all right. Okay, so let's sort of get into this and what's the learning. So the learning from Bonobos of consumer innovation, I think, uh, and I was an early investor in this company after meeting um, Andy Dunn, uh, was that the internet was fundamentally interesting as a way to reach certain kinds of customers certain kinds of customers. And in this particular thing, Andy and his partner, Brian Spaley, felt that there was a great fit between men and apparel and the internet. And why was that? Well, the name of the company gives it away a little bit. The name of the company is Bonobos. Does anyone know what a Bonobos is? <laughs> Bonobo, very good. Bonobos is a monkey. It's a rather amorous monkey, which we will not get into that, obviously. But it's, an, it's a monkey, and the theory was when men shop, men are like monkeys. They just want to grab, be done, you know, five pairs of pants, three socks, two pairs of shoes, and that's it. And so the insight was if you could deliver that consistent experience to men, that would be really interesting. Now, if you go back and you watch Andy Dunn circa 2009, 10, when the company was starting, he was very, very adamant that you would never, ever have a physical store. Because a physical store is inventory, it's staff, it's real estate, it's a real pain in the neck. You would never, ever want to have a store. And there was a whole idea of you know, software eating the world. The real world is going to go away. It's not going to be relevant. What have we actually found? The digital and the physical are actually complements, not substitutes. And the digital experience makes the real world better in ways that we can't even imagine. So the real world's certainly not going away and certainly not in consumer and retail. So this is a Bonobos guide shop. Did anyone ever go into a Bonobos guide shop? Okay, the economist called it the zero inventory store. It's perhaps no bigger than this room. So Prague, you can go in. You've got that nice jacket. I can say, sir, I think you look really good in check blue. You put it on. There's nothing that you can take away. And so it was a separation of the experience of interacting with me. I give you a coffee. And then the product is shipped to you. Okay? So the learning from this one, the internet is great for certain kinds of customers. And also, the early story here was that retail was never going to be important in physical form. They ended up opening up about 50 of these things. I'll get to the exit at the end too. Okay, secondly, Warby Parker. So I think this was the most popular one, right? <laughs> okay. So the genesis of Warby Parker, the insight here was, for consumer and retail innovation, the enabling factor of the internet is good for industries that are fundamentally bad and fundamentally sort of harm customers in some sense. So who kind of owns the global monopoly for eyewear? Like Zotica, right? So you may not know as a customer when you go into a store on Fifth Avenue into Lens Crafters and you pay $300 for a Tiffany sunglass that that was made somewhere probably for 15 and that like Zotica had the, had the license for the Tiffany brand name and that they also own the Lens Crafters and where you got your insurance done, they kind of own that too. So it's like a soup to nuts vertical integration that's completely non-transparent to the customer. So, and this is really funny, this goes back to the digital, non-digital attribute story. So I was showing some of my students in, in my class back in 2010, um, we're going to get to this one, diapers.com uh, net grocer data of how these e-commerce companies spread their footprint throughout the United States. And so these guys come into my office and they sort of said, hey, we've got this great idea, Professor. We're going to start a company selling stuff online. I'm like, tell me about it. This is I want to hear. Well, we're going to sell glasses. So you know, what did I know? That's why I was a professor. I didn't really know anything. I'm thinking, what a stupid idea. <laughs> you know? uh, doesn't this product have a tactile, non-digital component? 
oh yeah, we've thought of that. We're going to allow people to ship them to their home in a box, five for five days for free, and try them on before they buy. So has anyone here in the room done the home try-on program? Okay, <laughs> there you go. So the insight here was you could take an industry that was sort of structurally unkind, and you could make it better. And if you remember the early days of the website, they would show you why their price was 95, and the competition in a bar chart was like 300, because of all the excess margin that they were pulling out of the system. So what this company did is it really taught us about understanding when customers are particularly harmed by the structural characteristics of the industry. And also, interestingly enough here, um, we also learned a lot about omni-channel. So I'll, I'll mention Bonobos again in a moment too. But with Warby Parker, they started out with the website and the home try-on program. So Lewis, if you're a guy who likes to touch and feel the product, which of those two channels do you opt into? Give you a trial, right? So the people who want to touch and feel, they opt into the trial. So then, and just to tell you guys the numbers, about 50% of trials result in conversions. So if Warby Parker sends out 100 boxes, and this number is still roughly true today, they get about 50 people to buy within a two-month window. That's how they count conversion, okay? So then they sort of had this idea, well, maybe some people want to try more than five, because you've got some joker, I won't name anyone in the room here, some joker who's ordering like five boxes. But every time a box goes back and forth, that's $15 to Warby Parker, that's $75, and you're selling for 95, that's not good. So they said, well, gee, what if we actually had a physical presence? And they started with that yellow school bus. If you're interested, I could tell you about that. But they started to open up showrooms. And these were showrooms where you could go in and try on as many as you like, and then that they would ship them, ship them to your house, right? So now if you've got three channels, you've got online, try on, and a showroom that you can go into and touch and feel. If you really want to touch and feel the product, where do you go? You go into the showroom, right? So the people who get left in this middle channel of just you shipping them five for free, they're kind of the people who are saying, yeah, I think five's enough for me. So what we noticed, and we did some research on this, when we opened showrooms in different locations, sort of three things happened. First of all, overall demand went up, because now you've got three channels instead of two. Secondly, the number of boxes that you're sending out on the home try-on program, that didn't go up, that actually went down. Okay? So the number of orders went down, but the relative number of sales went up because the conversion increased because the people who were choosing the box when they could have gone into a showroom were sort of saying, hey, five's enough. And then the third thing that was really interesting is the returns went down too because the people have really complex needs. And this is the fun when you get into consumer data with companies that let you dig in. We knew everybody's prescription for their eyewear. And so we could sort of see, well, how bad is someone's eyewear? Oh, this person probably needs to wear glasses all day. Those people were great acquisition in the showroom. Okay? Cool. Well, yeah, we're going to get to that. <laughs> sure. Yeah, we're, we're, we're going to, uh, yeah, I, I've sold my stock, by the way, but anyway, <laughs> we're, we're, going to, we're going to get to that, which doesn't mean I'm not bullish on the company long term, but great question, we're going to, we're going to get to that piece of it. So, so Warby Parker sort of taught us that there are some industries that are just fundamentally challenged. What does Figs teach us? So Figs was started by Trina Spear from Harvard Business School, and she noticed that her physician friends on the weekend wore aloe yoga and lululemon, and they looked very fashionable, and they went to the gym, and then when they came to work, they're wearing sort of these frocks from like the 1950s, right? With a really terrible buying experience. So the idea of Lululemon for doctors became a thing and they went, to ho they went to hospitals in LA and they handed out free coffee and so on. And that's how that business started, okay? And then finally, Caraway, I think this, is, this has actually been now pegged as the fastest growing, I think, direct to consumer first brand of all time. And the insight here was you take a pretty staid, boring category like home goods and you say, hey, there's kind of three things wrong with it. You know, the high-end stuff's really overpriced. The companies that sell that stuff have absolutely no digital DNA at all. Oh, and by the way, the product's not particularly good for you. It's got Teflon and stuff that lasts for a long time. And that led Jordan, the founder, to start Caraway. Okay, so that's sort of a little bit of a story of consumer innovation. I'm gonna come back to the other piece later on, but hopefully the four bits that we got here is an insight about a fit between a channel and a certain customer, an insight about customers kind of, if you will, being done over by, by the man for structural reasons. Then we have an insight about you know, a product category that's just fundamentally boring as a product and also as a buying experience. And then lastly, we have sort of a product that's not terrible, but it's a bit overpriced. The purveyors of that product have no digital DNA, and also the product has some level of toxicity to it. Okay, so now let's get into retail innovation. 
And with retail innovation, what I want to do here is I want us to think about fundamentally uh, the platforms and sort of who does, who does what where. Okay? So consumer innovation, you're saying, what's wrong with the status quo? And with retail innovation, you're thinking, you know, what activity should be done by whom and where should it be done? Okay? So what I'm showing you guys here is a paper that I published a few years ago with Tony and, and Santiago, and it was called uh, How to Win in an Omnichannel World. Okay? And the idea was like, very simple. This actually comes from a classic book written by some professors at uh, Kellogg. And in the old days, uh, the only part of the matrix was, was sort of number one, okay? So there were two functions that retailers fundamentally have to do. First of all, they have to deliver you information. I have to say to Prague, hey, I think you look really good in blue. Yeah, try the check. You know, there's an exchange of information. This is the brand that you should buy. This is how much it costs. So information exchange. And then somehow, I also have to get the product in your hand. And back in the old days, the information exchange and the process of fulfillment both happened in a physical place called a what? Very good. I was just checking to see if you guys, are, you know, I know it's, <laughs> it's getting to the end of the quarter store. And so for the last, you know, millennia, what people do is they go into a dedicated physical space, it's called a store, and there's an exchange of information, and there's also a fulfillment of product. And then what happened is the internet got pretty interesting. We then sort of went down, I'm going to focus on one to four. So then the jackets.com comes along. And what Prague does now is he goes to jackets.com and he reads reviews and he looks at pictures and he sort of tries stuff out. Maybe he's got an avatar and so on. So all the information exchange is happening online. And then what he does is he just orders it and they send it to his home. Okay? So the world sort of evolved from one to four. But then things got sort of really interesting, as Prague just showed us last time. There's something called the information getting delivered online and then you coming along to pick the thing up. You know, the bops, the buy online, pick up in store. And I think it's a fascinating problem for grocery because in general goods, there was a really interesting effect. So my colleagues, Tony and Santiago, wrote a paper on bops using Crate and Barrel. Okay? And this is a few years ago. The CEO of Crate and Barrel was like really frustrated that crateandbarrel.com kind of sucked. You know, the sales were slow. It was just like nothing really happening. So the CEO said, you know, if we offer this sort of buy online, pick up in store thing, you know, we should be able to sell more stuff through crateandbarrel.com. People will see that the product's in stock, and I'm going to come back to that point too. They'll see the product's in stock and what the price is, and like sales at crateandbarrel.com are going to go up. So they run these experiments in these stores in North America and Canada, and what do they find after they offer price and inf inventory information online? Sales at crateandbarrel.com go down. But sales in the store and baskets go up because the customer sees, oh, this dining chair, oh, it's in stock. And I need four, but you know what? Most of the stuff they sell is kind of tactile. I, I better go in and check on it. And when you're in there looking at the chairs, of course, now you're not going to buy them online. You're going to buy them in the store. And then what else do you do? You buy other stuff. So there's this very counterintuitive thing that the bops actually stimulated the on-plan buying. Now, what's interesting about what Parag showed us, when the delivery pickup is in a box outside the store, that sort of mitigates it against that, right? So again, there's a fundamental thing in retail. How do you delineate between things that people plan to buy and basket build them when they get there? Okay, and then the final piece was the Warby Parker story, online retail plus showrooms. So now what you do is you go into a cool thing like the Bonobos Guide Shop where there's no product that you can take away, but you have a great sort of information exchange with the salesperson, and then the product is delivered to your home or office. Oh, and by the way, just trick, not trick, question for you guys. Um, if I'm Warby Parker, and I, I'm going to get back to them, <laughs> David. And I have the option to nudge you to get your glasses delivered to home versus the office. Where, where do I want to send that box of five? The office, right? Because there's going to be more social exposure. And what's really interesting, we never wrote a paper on this, but you could kind of see it in the data. Even though the conversion rate was only 50%, you might say, well, did you waste 15 bucks sending product out to people who ultimately didn't convert? Well, actually, you didn't. Because if you, especially if you went to the office, those people who didn't convert, they still showed other people the product, and they tried them on, and, and so there was actually an economic benefit from that sampling process. So sort of hold that thought as well. And then one other thing I'll say about Bonobos is really fascinating. So this was actually based on listening to someone else speak in a class years ago, and here, here was the idea. So imagine that uh, Lewis and I have an online exchange, okay? And I send Lewis an email, and it comes in, it's like, you know, David at idea face, like, who is this guy? Just deletes it, okay? And then I call Lewis up, and I'll, I'll, I'll do it in my friend's uh, voice, who said it, well, I won't do the voice, but I'll say what he said. And then Lewis hears my Long Island, uh, New Jersey accent, or whatever it is, 
He's like, oh, okay. So now there's a bit more emotional connectivity between Lewis and I. And then Lewis and I happen to meet at a conference in New Jersey, and we have a coffee, and we chit-chat, and now the bonding that we've kind of experienced has sort of gone up to here. So what happens the next time Lewis and I exchange an email or a text? It doesn't drop all the way down. It stays elevated. So I was sitting in the back. I was like, that's really interesting. I wonder if that works in retail and commerce. This is the idea of supercharging. So we got this data from Bonobos, and we did matched pairs of guys like Lewis and Prague, both shop at exactly the same rate. You buy the same stuff, you show up at the website at the same cadence, your AOV is the same, but for whatever reason, Lewis goes into a guide shop, even if it only happens once. Thereafter, in the future, his CLV, customer lifetime value, becomes higher. He shops at a faster cadence, he's got a higher AOV, he buys a broader amount of the Bonobos assortment, even if he's doing it online, and critically for e-commerce, what's the bugbear for e-commerce retail? If you're selling apparel, what's like the thing that drives you nuts? The return rate. Okay, so this is really cool. So I, I don't have a chance. I'm just going to do a little axis. Okay? So if the x-axis here is the dollar value of a product, and the y-axis is the return rate, you can imagine that the thing goes up like this. Like your socks don't really fit, yeah, whatever, you just suck it up, right? But that shirt doesn't fit, you might return it. If it's a suit, yeah, you're going to return it. So what we found was really interesting. The return rate increases in apparel with the order value, but if you're a guy who's gone into a Bonobos guide shop, there's a little scissor effect where your return rate goes down, not parallel, it goes down even more for stuff that's really expensive. Isn't that fascinating? So we call that sort of customer supercharging, and that's why we think physical presence of some sort in almost all kinds of retail is absolutely critical. Yeah, so basically, um, if you have a, a, a diagram like this, so Diane, so x-axis is the dollar value of what you're buying from, um, from Bonobo, so like $10 pair of socks, $50 t-shirt, $100 shirt, $400 suit, the chance that you return basically increases as a straight line. So you, maybe it's 30% return rate for suits and 10% return rate for socks, and that's the average. But if you have a guy like Lewis who goes into a Bonobo's guide shop and then he's buying stuff online, his return rate becomes lower than it was before, but what's really interesting, it opens up like a scissor, meaning that maybe his return rate on socks went down from 10 to 8, but his return rate on the suit went down from 35 to 17. So you're less likely to return the stuff that's really expensive, and the, the term that we coined for this was customer supercharging. Yeah? I think it's, it's a combination. You've had a more intimate experience with the brand, which means the physical presence, the product, the salespeople, the team, and everything else. Does that make sense, guys? Okay, cool. Yeah. Similar yeah. when they have the app and the waiter charges your card in the restaurant, it sits on top of it, so it seems when you're in front of it, you always get fired. Yeah. Versus when there's no pop up and you're left on your own device, you can walk away. Oh, this. So that human intervention. Sure. Well, there's sort of some social shaming, too. I hate this. You know, in New York now, you know, where I go and buy my, you know, I'm a bit of a frou-frou, obviously a bit of a frou-frou guy wearing this shirt. So, you know, of course I have to have alternative milk cortados, okay? But I'm going to have to cut the habit because you go in, you buy the thing, it's like 560 plus another buck for the milk, and then they turn the little thing around. And now, I, I mean, <laughs> it's not like, you know, I'm going to go broke tomorrow, but now I actually go to a store where they've configured it 10, 15, and 20 because the one that's 20, 50, 25, and 30, it's just too much. And you have to hit 25. Because otherwise, the guy's like, well, you just picked the lowest tip amount. So, you know, so now I literally go a little bit out of my way to a place where it's like 10, 15, and 20, so I can hit 15. Okay, I don't know if that answered the question, but uh, yeah, tactile experience. All right, uh, how please. How does this work? My daughter would order five of something. Yeah. Find the one that she likes and return the other four. Yeah, that, I mean, that's a real problem, right? That people, and it's a generational thing, right? People, and people have all it's been. Younger, in, I guess it's the younger thing. It's a younger thing. People have been sort of inculcated with the idea that shipping should be free because Amazon offers you Prime and stuff like that. So, you know, there are companies, uh, you know, maybe some of us know these companies in, in, the, in the room where they're trying to now give you an avatar or fitting technologies and things like that that can mitigate against it. You can try it on and see if you think that you like it. But this is like the worst thing in e-commerce for clothing. Um, there are companies now that, you know, also do returns at the... Um, store itself, hoping that you'll buy other stuff when you come in with your returns. You know, Returnly, have you guys seen some of these? Yeah. All right, cool. Oh, sorry, guys. I'll, I'll, this is great. I'm happy to take questions as we go all the time. So. There's a company called Rulala. Oh, sure. Absolutely. What they do is if you buy something, 
Yep. And you want to return it. If you don't get a replacement thing, you have to pay the shipper. What they'll do is... That's clever. That's clever. <laughs> that you're going to buy something else, but credit to your account, forcing you to come back and buy it again. And you have, if you're a new customer, you get free shipping for a short period of time. So this you is have to reorder within a short period of gotcha. time. Gotcha. This so is, that, that's yeah, smart. yeah, that's really smart. And actually, this is a great example because it ties in a little bit to what Figs did too, is they'd always be doing new drops of colors and stuff for doctors, but they'd be limited, and so you had to pull the trigger. Cool. So now I'm going to test something on you guys. So we're working on a, well, actually, sorry, I'll mention this and I'll test something. So the point that I want to really want to emphasize here is just the experiential nature of retail. And remember that axis, it was kind of information and fulfillment. You could argue now that information is almost more about experience. And has anyone here taken their kids to the Museum of Ice Cream? I mean, this is a very extreme form of retail where literally there's nothing to sell. Imagine going into a shop where literally you just jump into the sprinkle pool and you take a picture and you post it on Instagram and you've paid 20 bucks to go in. So before <laughs> the pandemic, you know, before the pandemic, people in New York are queuing up around the block to go to the Museum of Ice Cream, paying 20 bucks, and corporates are renting it out for $200,000. And literally, what's happening is you're going in there and you just created content, okay? So this is probably another little sort of segue here or thing that I want to mention to you guys. Think about how that device has totally changed, you know, every industry that you can imagine. Because there's like five properties of this thing that's mind-blowing. One is it's a distribution channel and a payment channel in one device. I can send Silas stuff and I can take his money. Amazing. Number two... It's a very, very small device that people have all the time upon which they are constantly snacking. The latest statistic I think I saw from Google is people spend four to five hours a day just on mobile apps. So you know in the old days, I showed Starbucks, you'd go in for your latte and you'd just kind of be zoning out. Yeah, I wonder, how, you know, I wonder if that guy's going to get 62 home runs tonight. I wonder how that's going to go. Yeah, what shall I have for breakfast tomorrow? Now, go into any Starbucks, get into any eleva you know, elevator. You used to stand there. I don't want to look at the guy next to me. Now it's fine because everyone's, you know, turkey neck <laughs> looking down, right? So constantly snacking, number two. Number three, it's location aware. That's amazing for marketers. Number four, it allows you to create, meme, and share rich content. And number five, it makes word of mouth more powerful. So something like the Museum of Ice Cream exists because everyone who walks in has got this. So now here's the innovation piece I want to share with you guys. So, um, you know, I must be sort of, you know how creative this is going to be, but I sort of figured we're rewriting this paper and there's going to share two companies with you guys. And um, we couldn't get a full three by three, but we think there's right two really interesting endpoints here. Okay? So, let me again share statistics. I don't have this great stat uh, pack that, that Prague had, but some of these, you know, will, will relate to what Prague said. So, if you think about the percentage of the economy that's e commerce, it's probably roughly 10 to 15 in the US. Somebody in the room may know better. Brazil, it's probably three. China, it's probably 20. And I mean averaged across all categories and all people. And obviously, if you dive into a category like contact lenses, it might be 80. And if you dive into another category like you know, bananas, it might be two. One of the really interesting things about the pandemic is the push that it had in taking grocery and putting that online. Because you know, I had a colleague at Wharton that used to joke, you know, Dave, the um, fraction of uh, groceries bought online in like 20, 2019. It's about the same as it was in 1619. Yeah, if you round down, it's basically zero, you know. Nobody wants to do it. So it's on average, it's about 20. So that means 80% of the stuff that's happening is happening in a physical space. And another statistic, people going into physical spaces called stores is only about 1.5% of their time. Interesting. Interesting. So how do retail and stuff start? Well, it started with stores. I go into the store and I buy the sweater. And then 30 years ago, this e-commerce in the store came to me, but why should that be the end of it? Why couldn't I be here in this hotel and I kind of, like, I really like that light thing. Like, why couldn't I just buy it? So why couldn't you take native environments and deliver information to people in native environments, okay? So the, sorry, down here, deliver information to people in native environments, like you stay in an Airbnb, like, why couldn't you buy the espresso machine? Okay, does that make sense to you guys? So there's a company I'm going to share with you that's doing exactly that. Okay. And then the other side of it, when you think about fulfillment or delivery, yeah, I mean, of course, I can go into a store like a supermarket and I can buy stuff. The supermarket could also send me stuff. But why couldn't Udayan have a little fridge in his house with some of the supermarket's inventory and some other dude come along on a bike and pick it up and, and give it to me? Like, why couldn't storage happen all over the place? Well, it is. And it's being enabled by the fact that inventory and price have gone online. So there's companies called Carry, 
and deliver who are literally doing that. So buy online, pick up in store, um, why can't I just get someone else to do that for me? Fascinating, right? So we're going to write a paper, you can tell me later if you pick the titles, because it's going to be called The Everywhere Store, but then we're going to put a um, S-T-O-R, there's an A-G in bracket, and an E at the end. So it's The Everywhere Store and Storage, and I really think that is absolutely where retail innovation is going. That information and fulfillment will start to happen in native environments. So let's sort of make this real. So this is a company, Minoan, started by an alumni of Jet.com, and literally connecting people with products in spaces that feel like home, native shopping. There's a really cool company, I met a founder in LA, unfortunately didn't invest in it, um, but it's called Alta, if you need outdoor furniture, right? It's, it's awesome, it's restoration hardware at lower prices, and the genius part is, if David buys one of their couches and he has it in his backyard in the Hollywood Hills, they will come and take pictures. And then if he's willing to do it, like he can take bookings and I can show up at his house and sit on the couch and he gets paid for the appointment and if I buy it. Genius. Like some dude might actually buy a couch and think, you know what, I'm going to pay for the family's Christmas holiday by monetizing that couch. Why not? So here's another crazy thing since we mentioned Jet. The internet, my friends, is the world of the extreme. Now, what do I mean by that? When diapers.com was in play, they had an incentive program, which you have to have if you're an e-commerce business, because the best engine of new customers is existing customers. So we had a thing in place, you know, if you buy, I know we've got some young dads here with the new kids, if I sign you up and you buy um, diapers at diapers.com, I get a $1 credit into my account, okay? Now, what was amazing about this thing is out of the first 100,000 customers, about 8,000 people sort of took advantage of this thing, so it's not bad. Those 8,000 people referred other people, okay? Now, how many on average do you think they referred? 10, 2, what do you reckon? No, no, okay, we'd split the difference, not too bad, it's about four, okay? So from 8,000 customers, you just got yourself 32,000 new customers, that's pretty cool. But again, and, and Google and, and Udai and you guys, the team would know this better, the internet's not just the world of the average, it's the world of the extreme. The top 150, so top 100 customers referred 150 each. That's 15,000. So when Mark Law launched Jet.com, the biggest problem he had is he had no customers. So in 2015, his second go-round after selling diapers to Amazon in 2011 for 550 million was Jet.com. So what did he do? He put out in the space there, hey, you sign up five people, free shipping for a year. You do 10, Lewis, free shipping for two years. You're the most. You sign up the most people for me. Here's what I'm going to give you. Now, I don't know if we should suggest this, but I'm going to give you 100,000 shares of stock in my company, Jet.com. Well, the internet's the world of the extreme. Some guy and his wife actually did this. If you Google him, his name is Eric Martin. You'll find a really nice picture of Eric and his wife smiling, wearing Jet.com t-shirts, and a little baby, because when the acquisition happened, that guy made 20 million US dollars. Because the internet is the world of the extreme. Okay? So I think, yeah, so this is this one. This one here started in Chile. This is everyday storage. So why should the end of the story be, okay, there's stuff in a warehouse somewhere. Why couldn't I pick and pack out of a store? Why couldn't I pick and pack out of somebody's home? Why couldn't I use logistics infrastructure to do it? So if you look at where clouds, they're now coming to the US, they're doing exactly that. Okay, just wanna be cognizant of the time. I'm gonna finish bang on time. So, all right. So, that's sort of given you a bit of, hey, this is good, this innovation's amazing, this is fantastic, okay? It's a little bit like the old movie, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly. We have to be real about innovation. Let's get to maybe some of the bad. So there's an article that came out in 2018, over 400 startups are trying to become the next Warby Parker, everything from, you know, a uh, wild race to overthrow every consumer category, et cetera, et cetera. Now, it turned out that there were some challenges in this space as a result of all this innovation, sort of three things haven't completely collapsed the house, but we'll come back to it. So the first thing was like massive duplication, because if someone had a good idea called Casper, ship your mattress in a box, well, I think at one point it was like 200 companies shipping your mattress in a box. Okay, so massive proliferation. That company obviously had a bit of an unfortunate public event. It's, I think it's worth, le worth less than the money it's taken in. Not to disparage anybody, but duplication happened quickly. The second thing that Udayan and the team have been talking about is the customer acquisition cost. There was an arbitrage through digital channels that you could acquire customers pretty cheaply on Facebook, Insta, and so on, and then build up a business really quickly. Those days are out the window, and I'm gonna come back to that in a moment. Um, and then the final thing here is the exit. Okay, so remember our four-star brands that we had on the slide? So Bonobos, 
founded roughly 2007, 2008. In 2017, sold to Walmart for 310 million. Actually, not a bad outcome, right? Warby Parker went public and had a bit of a pop to the stock. It was about 55 bucks in September 2021. Figs went public in, I think, May 2021. Also had a bit of a pop. At some point, Figs was worth about $7 billion. Warby Parker was worth about $5.5 billion. If you look ahead today, both of those companies, the stock is off 75%. Now, that doesn't mean it's going to stay there, but just, you know, the, the, the exit outcome hasn't sort of panned out for a variety of reasons in the way that we might have expected. So when I was preparing for this talk, I thought, you know, let me take an old school company, you know, the world's biggest retailer, a company called Walmart, and let me just type in their stock and like see how much it's up since it first, first listed. Any idea how much Walmart stock is up? So Warby Parker and Figs is down 75% since listing. Walmart is up not 1,000% or two, it's up 24,000% since it first listed. So maybe you have to take a you know, long-term view on these things. All right. Um, and here's the last piece, and then we'll wrap it up in the next two minutes. So, so the good, the bad, the ugly. Now we'll get into the ugly. I think this is the fun territory, because the ugly is kind of in the eye of the beholder, right? Like I had someone come up to me earlier, I won't say who, say, that is the worst sweater I've ever seen. And then there was some other gentleman who said, yeah, I love your sweater, can we swap right now? And I, I said no to both. Okay? True story. <laughs> you know I would never lie to you. You know I'm from New Zealand, right? I'm not an Australian. You know, I didn't drink a beer before the, present <laughs> before the presentation. I know we're getting to it, yeah. Okay, so <laughs> are these ugly ducklings or swans? So I think there's three really interesting opportunities in the, in the retail and consumer space as they come together. So what's wrong with the status quo? Who should do what? So this I, paper we wrote a few years ago, the store is dead, long live the store. This was this paradox that in the retail land, bankruptcies out the wazoo, but also stores that were doing really great. Like what delineated them? And a lot of the delineation was through inventory fulfillment efficiency and also experience, right? Second thing that I think is fascinating <laughs> now um, is the emergence of platforms for these D2C brands, right? So remember way back when with Amazon and then those diapers, generalist specialist, well, what we're seeing now is, is the platform called Disco, for example. And Disco, if you like, you know, figs, you want to pretend to be a doctor on the weekend, you buy figs, they'll like serve you an ad for Caraway to cook your, you know, cook your food and suggest that you should wear all bird shoes and brush your teeth with a quick toothbrush. It's literally a platform for D2C brands. So I think the emergence of platforms will be really interesting. And then the last slide here, you know, I used to teach at Wharton, so it was like a rule. I, I think Katie violated it this morning, so I have to send her an email. There was a message from the dean Every presentation, if you've had any affiliation at Warden or probably Princeton, you have to have at least one equation, okay, in your slide, okay. Now, this is an equation for Bayes' rule, but what this is showing here that I think is fascinating and germane to everybody in the room, when the CAC arbitrage of digital goes out the window, and you guys spoke very eloquently about this, how do you sort of figure out probabilistically, yeah, I think this is a dude, I think he's very well dressed, you know, he's this and, you know, so probabilistic attribution, you don't exactly know who it is, but using big data and AI, I can make a very informed judgment so that I'm not just searching, but I'm serving stuff up to people that's going to be relevant. Okay, so I think those are the three kind of interesting things here. If you want to put them in a framework, the three Ps, so sort of where do we place product and experience? How do we grow interesting platforms? And finally, probabilistic attribution. And I think I took my five minutes back. And that's the end of the story. So thanks so much. Thank you. Any questions for David before we wrap up? Yeah. Happy to take any, any questions. Oops. Grab that coffee. Yeah, please. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a great question. So, so what I'll say here is, um, and as a consumer investor, there are a couple of others in the room, like capital efficiency, EBITDA, unit economics, they're now sort of king. And I think the realization, so you may have read this, it was actually written by a friend of mine that I used to bring into class. So in 2013, Aileen Lee wrote a very popular article on TechCrunch. She was leaving Kleiner Perkins as the youngest ever female partner at a very prestigious firm and starting her own firm called Cowboy Ventures. And she wrote an article, it was called Welcome to the Unicorn Club, looking for the billion dollar startup. 
And what people forget is that was based on technology and life sciences companies. It wasn't necessarily meant to be prescri prescriptive, but I saw it as a, as a teacher. Then everybody in your class think, oh, I want to start a unicorn. I'm going to sell like socks on, you know. Everybody doing everything sort of aspired to these huge outcomes. And then at that time, too, a lot of the venture capitalists that were participating and funding these companies sort of funded them through the alphabet like a tech company, A, B, C, D, E. Whereas we're, a, you know, I'll give you a company with an amazing outcome for investors and the founder. There's a company called Native that makes natural deodorant. This guy had this insight, oh, the natural category is like minuscule. Let me make this thing called Native and sell it direct online. He raised about a million and a half bucks. He got to 20 million in sales and he sold it to P&G because P&G had no idea. You know, I talked to the lady who ran their venture team. She said they spent like 150 million bucks they blew trying to attack that category themselves because they don't really understand bottom-up innovation. So they bought that guy for 100 million. If you'd put 500K into that company, think about the IRR on the two-year turnaround. So I think the space now is becoming much more about discipline and sort of realistic expectations about how big these companies can go if they're really consumer companies. And the ones that we looked at, I would say, you know, where clouds in Minoan, they could potentially be huge, right? But everything else has a product, is a product with a, with a cost basis. Yeah, great question. Yeah, please. Oh, abs absolutely. So, you know, like Airbnb, right, taught you that, yeah, you might like to make a little extra cash by renting out your spare room. Like, why not, if you've got a spare closet, why not fill it up with lipstick? And then, you know, basically what will happen is then you will service, like someone will come by your house, you'll be paid by a brand to store it there, so that then some, exactly, so some customer in your neighborhood can then get that product. And so sort of Airbnb has kind of taught us that, yeah, you can monetize by having people stay, but why not monetize by holding inventory? Because that then facilitates faster access to customers. So there's a bunch of companies trying to figure that, figure that out. Uh, Where Cloud started in Chile. Yeah, it's in the desk. So think of warehouse, Where Clouds, because I guess all the information's in the cloud. But the, the big idea there, I think, is why does inventory only have to be stored in a warehouse? And you know the other fact that's really interesting, another stat, is the e-commerce deliveries that happen in your neighborhood is pretty much the same average every day. Like where I live in sort of Tribeca, Soho, there's probably like, a, there's, maybe there's 1,000 packages going on Monday, maybe there's 980 on Tuesday. I mean, there's almost no variation at the level of a local area. I mean, of course, different people buying stuff, but if you have distributed vehicles picking things up, then this can easily be, be accomplished through technology. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I had a question about Shopify. Yes. Uh, I think in the last two years, about five, maybe five or six companies went public yeah. that were built purely on Shopify. I think Pitch is one of them. Mm -hmm. uh, all those are another one. Just you know, names I don't remember. Uh, I'm curious, do you, do you see that as continuing trend where companies are going to get to a big enough scale on a third party platform? Yeah. Yeah, I, so I think it's a, it's a great question. So the question is, you know, um, are companies going to get sick of Shopify? It can only take you so far. So I think that, obviously, Shopify, can you can do amazing things on it. And I think it's a little bit of a pushback against, you know, since we mentioned Bonobos, back in the day, they actually opened a technology arm in Palo Alto, and then they had to close it pretty quickly because they were not really a tech company. So I think companies got burned by trying to build out their own tech stack when there's actually other companies who are specialists. Like, why would I build my own tech team just to, you know, give a plug to Odion when the things that Odion does, he's going to do way better than I could possibly do as a brand. But, you know, there may be a point at which you have some proprietary secret source. So we've invested in one company that's in the services space. They're developing their own tech because they see it as a moat. But generally, I think you can get pretty big just on, on third party. Thank you so much. Sure. You're welcome.